The title of our sermon this morning is, is Cling to Truth in Perilous Times. Cling to Truth in Perilous Times. And we're in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. We've taken a break there this morning of working through the Gospel of John, which we've done uh, each week. Uh, but we like to work verse by verse through text, and so we're going to study another text together this morning, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. And I want to introduce this passage to you um, from a story out of Greek mythology of all places. Uh, in Greek mythology, there is the story of the Lotophagi. We can say that together, Lotophagi. <laughs> now you know a Greek word. Uh, that's the story of the lotus eaters, the lotus eaters. And the lotus eaters are a people that lived on an island with a narcotic fruit that caused the people on that island uh, to sleep their lives away in a peaceful apathy. In Homer's Odyssey, now that's the epic poem, not the minivan. Uh, in Homer's Odyssey, the main character, Odysseus, tells of stopping at this island. Okay, and I want you to listen to what Odysseus describes. He says, here... We landed to take in fresh water, and our crews got their midday meal on the shore near the ships. When they had eaten and drunk, I sent two of my company to see what manner of men the people of that place might be. They started at once and went about among the lotus eaters, who did them no hurt, but gave them to eat of the lotus, which was so delicious that those who ate of it left off caring about home and did not even want to go back and say what had happened to them. Now, in his, his 1832 poem, The Lotus Eaters by Alfred Tennyson, Alfred Tennyson gives you the experience of the ship's crew when they landed on this island. And as you listen to this experience of the ship's crew, keep in mind that Tennyson has the crew here arguing against the Christian life. Listen to what they say. Let us swear an oath, the crew said amongst themselves, and keep it with an equal mind. In the hollow lotus land, to live and lie reclined. On the hills like gods together, careless of mankind. For they, the gods, lie beside their nectar, and the bolts are hurled far below them in the valleys, and the clouds are lightly curled round their golden houses, girdled with the gleaming world. Where they smile in secret, looking over wasted lands, blight and famine, plague and earthquake, roaring deeps and fiery sands, clanging fights and flaming towns and sinking ships and praying hands. But they smile. They smile, they find a music centered in a doleful song, steaming up a lamentation and an ancient tale of wrong, like a tale of little meaning, though the words are strong, chanted, we would say preached, from an ill-used race of men that cleave the soil, sow the seed, and reap the harvest with enduring toil, storing yearly little dews of wheat and wine and oil, till they perish and they suffer, some tis whispered, down in hell. Suffer endless anguish. Others in Elysian valleys dwell, resting weary limbs at last on beds of asphodel. Surely, surely, slumber is more sweet than toil. The shore than labor in the deep mid-ocean, wind and wave and oar. So rest ye, brother mariners, we will not wander more. You can see the deception and the fake peace, the superficial peace that comes upon them. There are many, there are many, many who profess to be Christians today who are asleep. They have eaten the narcotic fruit of a false Christianity and in love with this hollow lotus world that we live in, they have sworn an oath together to live at ease and lie reclined. They smile, a hypocritical smile, while sin reigns in what they call a church. They smile, hypocritical smiles at strongly worded tales of little meaning to them, 
ancient tales preached by an ill-used race of men that cleave the soil and sow the seed. And they're fearful. They're fearful to say it out loud, but they say it with their lives. Surely, surely slumber is more sweet than toil. The shore is more sweet than labor in the deep mid-ocean with wind and wave and oar. And they say this until they perish. And among themselves, it is whispered that some perish and suffer down in hell. The Lord Jesus Christ says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. It's a frightful statement from our Lord Jesus Christ. Thousands upon thousands of hollow places that call themselves churches offering a narcotic fruit that causes people who profess to be Christians to sleep their lives away in a peaceful apathy. The preachers and the people in those churches saying, rest, ye brother mariners, we will not wander more. This is a little bit of Christianity, a little bit of Christian truth wrapped in the rotting carcass of a lie to comfort the guilty consciences of people who desire pleasure, desire comfort, rather than truth. Now, if you'll notice from both the story and from real life, that which has become their comfort, that which has become their peace, will ultimately become their destruction. Do you see? This is like millions, millions. That's no exaggeration. Millions who sit in easy believism Southern Baptist churches each week. They eat the deceptive lotus fruit of a false unbiblical gospel. That's not all Southern Baptist churches, but there are many who preach a false gospel. They eat the deceptive lotus fruit of that false unbiblical gospel of asking Jesus into their heart or praying to receive Christ. They'll preach to you once saved, always saved, while you live in your sin. And they'll say to one another, live at ease and lie reclined. They will mock or rebuke that preacher or that evangelist who chants that sorrowful song, an ancient tale of wrong, all the while smiling. Or the millions who sit in liberal Methodist or liberal Presbyterian or Lutheran churches who teach today that the Bible isn't relevant anymore. And so they ordain women into the ministry and they comfort homosexuals and adulterers and murderers in their sin. Or those millions in Roman Catholicism who eat the deceitful and empty lotus fruits of tradition, of ritual. Or the millions that sit under charismatic snake oil salesmen that offer health and wealth and prosperity. Or man-centered self-help rather than the righteousness of God in Christ through faith. Or those who sit in Reformed Baptist churches who have the right doctrine on paper, but that right doctrine never reaches into their heart. By the grace of God, there remains a remnant of biblical churches that hold fast to the faith. However, to one degree or another, every single mainline denomination has compromised the gospel. All under a banner of Christianity, and these heresies collect themselves like barnacles on the bottom of a boat Attacks on the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture are everywhere. Assaults on the very purity of the gospel itself. A denial of the power of God in the gospel to transform lives. A rejection of the substitutionary blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Godliness and holiness of life sacrificed on the altar of self-love. Marriage and the family undermined at every turn sodomy accepted in the church and even in the ministry. Short-lived religious experiences substituted for spirit-empowered perseverance in the faith. False lying hypocrites in the pulpit lead to false lying hypocrites in the pew. Heresy in the professing church, this heresy, this error, this departure from biblical truth is the means by which many, many people today comfort themselves in false religion. They will willfully suppress the truth of God in a lazy spiritual slumber, 
floating along on flowery beds of ease while they care for their dog more than they care for doctrine. Or they love TV more than they love the truth. They'll plan for Saturday night and think very little of their eternal soul. And they'll say to themselves, surely this slumber and error is far more sweet than toil in the truth. When this is the attitude of many who profess the name of Christ, we live in dangerous, troublesome, and perilous times. Deceitful times. Such dangerous times that the Lord says in Luke chapter 18, verse 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Second Timothy, this letter is Paul's last will and testament to his son in the faith, young Pastor Timothy at the church in Ephesus. Paul, as he writes, sits in a prison cell chained to a Roman guard. No flowery beds of ease for the apostle Paul. Although he is chained, he boldly states in chapter 2, verse 9, that the word of God is not chained. He knows that this letter, these words, will go forward. It'll go forward to Timothy, and it'll go forward to the church in Ephesus. And he wants Timothy... He wants the church, he wants Christians to understand what they're up against. And he wants to tell you, he wants to exhort you to stand bold and strong in the faith for the Lord Jesus Christ. By implication to those who are not saved, he tells you, don't cling to a superficial nonsense, cling to the truth of God in Christ and be saved. Paul tells Timothy to be bold in the gospel and to hold fast to the faith in chapter 1. He describes the Christian life using metaphors in chapter 2, metaphors of an embattled soldier, right? A competing athlete, a hard-working farmer, or vessels of honor. Those metaphors for the Christian life, nothing to do with ease and pleasure. And as he comes to chapter 3, he warns Timothy then of the thorns and thistles in the church and the perilous times that we're facing. So as we come to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, the first thing I want you to see is we have to discern the times that we're in. Discern the times that we're in. For Timothy and the congregation at Ephesus, first there's a call to discernment. Understand the times in which we live and in which we minister. And don't allow those times to undermine your confidence. With that call to discernment, there's also a call to duty. That duty is to preach the word. He gives that command to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Preach the word. Discern the times that you're in. Don't allow yourself to be led away, gullible and deceived after false teachers, false gospels. Cling to the truth of God in Christ. Cling to his word. Secondly, you must cling to the truth. We'll see that in verses 6 through 8. Many will reject the truth. Many who profess the name of Christ reject the truth and they find themselves disqualified from the faith. We must cling in meticulous faithfulness to the word of God if you're going to protect yourself from error. You must cling to the word of God in meticulous faithfulness if you're going to combat error. We have to cling to the Bible. It's the only source of truth. Thirdly, we have to hope in Christ. We'll see that in verse 9. There will certainly be times of trouble, but listen, Christ has triumphed. And so you can rest in Christ. You can trust in Christ. You can put your hope in Christ. So take your place then on the front lines of our spiritual warfare. Looking forward to your eventual rest, take your place on the front lines, and rather than choking and gagging and dying on the lotus fruit of a wicked, false Christianity, follow the Lord Jesus Christ and cling to his word. Now let's take a look at point one. Discern the times. Look at verse one. Now Paul says to Timothy, but know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. Now Paul charges Timothy, and he charges all of us in chapter two, verse 15, to be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But in three Verse 1, even though you faithfully do that, even though you labor diligently with the word, even though God, in verse 25, may grant repentance to some 
And even though some, in verse 26, may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, know this, Paul says, mark my words. In the Greek, it's live with this continuous understanding that in the last days, perilous times will come. Paul essentially says, listen, you're laboring for the Lord. You're laboring for the Lord, but don't ever lose sight of this reality. Don't lose sight of this reality. It's a word here for know, meaning that Timothy is to know it through observation. He's to know it through his experience. Violent, terrible, difficult, dangerous, troublesome, perilous times will come. So what is certain then, young Pastor Timothy? What's certain? Death, taxes, and troublesome times, right? These times of trouble are going to come. Now, like Timothy and the church at Ephesus, we know this to be true in our own experience, don't we? We see this all the time through our own observation, through our own Christian experience. We know in the same way that they did. We certainly have the word of God that validates this truth. If you look at chapter 3, drop down to verse 12. The word of God testifies, yes, verse 12, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Look at verse 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Look at chapter 4. Look down at verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, They will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And we can see that in our own times, can't we? That's the truth. That's an experience of much of the modern church today. Look back at 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and look there at verse 1. Verse 1. Here Paul says, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. They'll give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe in and know the truth. The Bible is abundantly clear on this point. And Paul is writing something that applies to them in that day and age, in the first century. But know this, Paul says, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Now, when do these last days begin? Are we in the last days? Have they yet to arrive? Or are we here? Look with me at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. When do these last days begin? Know this. Perilous, troublesome, dangerous, even violent times will come. That's what the word means. Acts chapter 2, drop down to verse 14. Verse 14. This is Peter at Pentecost. This is the beginning, the birth, if you will, of the New Testament church. And during Peter's sermon, look at verse 14. Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, but this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Now, what had happened at this point in time? The Holy Spirit had been given to these who were saved and at the inauguration of the church. The Holy Spirit had been given. So the Holy Spirit is given and they see men speaking in their own language, in their own language, the wonderful words of God. They see tongues of fire on their head. They experience the outpouring here of the Holy Spirit. What Peter says in his sermon is that this is then a fulfillment of that which the prophet Joel has spoken in Joel chapter 2. So he quotes Joel chapter 2 and verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. When does it come to pass? In the last days. No, it comes to pass then. So when are the last days? Then. Those last days are upon them at that point. It shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. 
Peter sees this here, this point in time at Pentecost, the birth of the church. Peter sees this as a fulfillment of that prophecy in Joel chapter 2 of the last days, right? Go with me then to Hebrews. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 1. When do these last days begin? Hebrews chapter 1. Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. And look at verse 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. We hear the Bible reads, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by a son, through whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. So again, this is God speaking in various times and in various ways to the fathers by the prophet in those days, now in these last days, speaking to us. In the same way again through dreams and visions like the prophet Joel prophesied of the time at Pentecost? No, in these last days through his son. We have the word of God in his son given to us in the Bible. We have the Bible now. So he speaks to us in his son in these last days. Look at a couple of books to the right. First John, Hebrews, James, First Peter, Second Peter, First John. First John, and look at chapter two. And John reiterates this point. Again, we're looking at when do these last days begin? First John chapter two, drop down to verse 18. Here John says, little children, it is the last hour. This was written in the first century, the end of the first century. Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. And here, John gives evidence of how we are to know that it is the last days, the last hour the truth, the reality that many antichrists have come. And we know from the word of God that the final antichrist will come at some point in the future. So from 2 Timothy, back in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, here's the truth from the Bible. The last days began with the beginning of the church age. After the resurrection and ascension of the Lord, the last days here began. And the last days will continue until the Lord comes back to execute judgment. So we live, we live in these perilous last days. It means these dangerous, violent, terrible times are upon us. They're here right now. We live in the reality of them. Like Timothy, we can observe this, can't we? This is no mystery to you and I, is it? I mean, watch the news for five minutes. Open the newspaper. Any, well, if you still do that, <laughs> open the newspaper to any place. It's just obvious we live in the last days. Visit any number of churches around here. And you know that we live in the last days. What are you to do? What's to be your response? Discern the times. Discern the times in which we're living. How does that apply to you? This is no time for a lazy, apathetic, false professing Christian. We live in perilous times. This is spiritual warfare. People are dying and going to hell. This is no time to live at ease and recline. We're not in peace time here. You've got to get on the front lines with Timothy. Get on the front lines with our brothers and sisters in Ephesus. Get on the front lines with genuine brothers and sisters and wage the good warfare. These times are growing progressively worse and worse with every passing day, it seems like now. And people are dying. People are being deceived. We have to get on the front lines and fight the good fight of faith. Preach the word of God. One of the reasons, one of the applications of this passage is to you now is to say, listen, don't be lazy. Don't be apathetic. Don't live at ease. Our rest is ahead of us, is coming, but our rest is not now. But listen, the other application to you at this point is don't have unreasonable expectations either. 
It's often easy, isn't it, for the, the man of God, the woman of God, who's being faithful to God, out there sharing, preaching the gospel. Isn't it easy sometimes for us to get discouraged? You can with the error, with the turning away, with the apostasy, with those being led away like gullible women, loaded down with their sins, it can be discouraging, disheartening to the Christian. And I, I believe that's one of the primary reasons that even genuine brothers and sisters in Christ have difficulty sometimes in faithfulness to evangelism. If you walked out this door right now and you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt for a fact that there's a man sitting in that lobby, all you have to do is walk up to him and give him the gospel and he is going to be gloriously saved. Would you do it? Of course you will. You know you're convinced you'd walk out there and do that boldly, thankfully, gratefully to God, right? What prevents that from happening when you know that God is sovereign over salvation? It's God who changes the heart. It's God who regenerates the lost, dying sinner. What is it that keeps you from that duty? And what keeps you from delighting in that duty? Sometimes I think it's just discouragement Sometimes the disheartening reality that that person is going to reject the message that you preach. Listen, Paul says, God warns us, perilous times are here. Perilous times are, don't be shocked by that. Don't be discouraged by that. Don't be disheartened by that. He's going to say later, take hope in Christ and be faithful. Here to Timothy in Ephesus, be faithful, Timothy. Wage the good warfare. Fight the good fight. Preach the gospel. We live in perilous times. Don't let that discourage you. Know it. Live in that reality and fight the fight of faith. It's interesting here that the word for times in verse 1 is a word that means seasons or epics. There will be seasons or periods of peril. We know from the Bible that those seasons, those periods of time, get worse and worse and worse, and then the end comes. They're like birth pangs. They're described as birth pangs. They're contractions before birth that get more and more frequent and more and more painful before the birth finally happens, right? We know that to be true in our own day and age. Wickedness, not getting better and better and better. This world is not getting better and better and better. This world getting worse and worse and worse. We can see it in history, can't you? There's a time of peace. There's a time of peace, and then a dark age begins where there is death and devastation, millions plummeting headlong into hell, and then the Reformation comes, right? And then there's war, and there's famine, and there's persecution, and then a great awakening comes. And then there's persecution, and there's war, rumors of war, a war on terror, and it'll happen all over again, right? These birth pangs, these seasons coming, they're getting closer and closer, these painful, troublesome seasons, closer and closer together. They happen more and more frequently. They become more and more painful, and then the end will come. There's a world war, a short time of peace, a second world war, and then a shaky peace, we can see it in our own experience. And the Bible's not short on evidence for what this peril will look like. Paul says in chapter 3, verse 13, back in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, Paul explains that evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. Do you see that? In Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 7, Jesus Christ himself says this, that nation will rise against nation. There will be famines and pestilence, earthquakes in various places. And these, he says, are the beginnings of sorrows. He goes on to say in verse 11, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Peter says, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, that scoffers will come in the last days. They walk according to their own lusts and say, where is the promise of his coming? You hear the mocking? Jude says in verse 18 that there will be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause division, not having the spirit. 
Now, in addition to that, throughout the Bible, Paul gives us plenty of evidence right here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. Verses 2 through 5 here serve as the evidence that we're living in these dangerous last days. And at the same time that they're the evidence that we live in these dangerous last days, they are the cause of the perilous times in which we live. Now see if you recognize some of these today. Verse 2, for men, and that's a generic word there in the Greek meaning people, people. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Wow, that is a a tragic list. And that's merely a representative list. It's not exhaustive. And the first thing I want you to notice there is notice the bookends on either end of our list there. Verse 2, lovers of themselves. At the end of verse 4, rather than lovers of God. Now, in encompassing those two and everything in between, there are 19 adjectives used here to describe lost people in these last days. And these two bookends, this inclusio, if you will, summarizes this entire list. Lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. Jesus said to be his disciple. In order to be his disciple, you must die to yourself. Not be a lover of yourself, you're to die to yourself. He says in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, listen to this. If anyone comes to me, these are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And these people in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2, are lovers of themselves. Means to say that the Lord Jesus Christ is so supreme, everything fails by comparison. You love the Lord Jesus Christ supremely, preeminently above all else. That's why so much of false Christianity is so man-centered today. False Christianity is man-centered because men, verse 2, will become lovers of themselves. Men don't want to hear a a woeful song of ancient wrongs. Uh, They want to be puffed up. I want to go to church where I feel good. I don't know what he said, but I just felt good leaving there, right? They sing a couple of songs. They go out on top of the world. Messages of self-esteem, self-worth, self-fulfillment, self-help, self-value, self-love. It's the the pop psychology, feel good, false gospel. Listen to these popular book titles today. When I say popular, like best-selling book titles, okay? And this is not an exhaustive list. It's just a representative list. From America's pastor, Joel Osteen. Become a better you. Seven keys to improving your life. Man-centered, right? Joyce Myers. Change your words and change your life. Norman Vincent Peale, you can if you think you can. (laughs) T.D. Jakes, why? Because you're anointed. (laughs) Creflo Dollar, you're supposed to be wealthy. (laughs) Stephen Furtick, greater, dream bigger, start smaller. Robert Schuller. Self-love. You can't be more clear than that, right? <laughs> Self-love. Stacy Eldridge. Becoming myself. Embracing God's dream of you. Dan Allender. To be told God invites you to co-author your future. And several of those titles you could take, you could turn into something that was Biblical. But unfortunately, sadly, that's not what's taking place in those books. Man-centered, self-love, self-value, self-esteem, self-worth, self-fulfillment, self-help, self-indulgence. 
And these are ridiculous extremes here, but there are so many, so many more that are insidiously and dangerously deceptive. We live in dangerous and perilous times where there are many who are gullible and weak and led away captive by error. Out of self-love, in verse 2, flows a love for money, of course, right? Out of self-love flows a love for money. That's representative here of a love for this world. It's talking about an immoderate desire to acquire wealth. You just pursue wealth. That on the heels of 1 Timothy chapter 6, where Paul says to be content with your food and your clothing. And that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now this covetousness is an obvious root, an obvious root of the false prosperity gospel. Why is it that many, millions, are taken away with this when it's so obvious, right? It's nothing more than textbook covetousness wrapped up in some lying skin of the truth. It's wrapped up in a lie that God wants you wealthy. <laughs> Creflo Dollar, you're supposed to be wealthy. They are, in verse 2, boasters. They're self-exalting. They're absorbed with their own superiority. Uh, all that you have, all that I have is my own doing. Look at all I've achieved, right? They're like Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4. Is this not great Babylon that I've built for myself, this royal dwelling that I've built by my own mighty power, Nebuchadnezzar says, and he's judged by God for it. In verse 2, they're proud, the feelings of self-importance. The Bible says that God is opposed to the proud, yet here they are proud. They're blasphemers, means they're crude, they're irreverent. They treat as common that which is supposed to be revered as holy. We see this kind of irre irreverence going on churches, going around in churches all the time today. Churches that try to be relevant, and so they take crude, irreverent subjects. In order to be relevant, in order to be real, relational, right, they take these subjects that are, that are crude, and they try to peddle them off in the church to attract people who are themselves crude and irreverent. And so you see not God-honoring, Christ-exalting sermons on sex or intimacy, you see crudeness peddled in the church, irreverence peddled in the church, sermons on subjects designed by God to glorify him, and yet they are reduced to a trashy tabloid. They are disobedient to parents. They undermine and they demonstrate contempt for one of the most important relationships in life. And this is representative here of undermining God-given, God-designed authority in your life. They're disobedient to parents. They become a law unto themselves. It's no mystery that those who are disobedient to parents, that in them you see an ungratefulness in verse 2. They're unthankful. They fail to express gratitude. They're entitled in their thinking. They see graces received as rights deserved. And they get offended when they don't get what they think they deserve. They're unholy. Unholy means they would rather feed on sewage than feed on the word of God. They lust for that which is vile or ungodly. Barclay says that they offend against the fundamental decencies of life. Often churches today, in a misguided effort to be relevant, real, relational, they drag that which is unholy into the church where you see churches that will use ungodly movie clips or ungodly music. Worship of God. It's, about to be, it's a, supposed to be about the worship of God, and yet they reduce everything to the entertainment of man. An ungodly, unholy man at that. They are unloving. It's a word there for unloving, meaning that they are hard-hearted. They're unfeeling. They lack natural affections. It'd be like the affections that you have for family members, right? Natural affections, they lack those affections. This word for unloving was used to describe Seneca. Seneca was a, a Roman advisor to Nero. And Seneca was berated for justifying the drowning of babies who were sickly or deformed 
just excoriated for that. It was called, this word, for unloving. And yet that happens in spades in our time, in our culture today, doesn't it? Through abortion. Not simply sickly or deformed, but inconvenient. And people will kill their babies and they will stand up in front of the Congress, the country, the people and shout and proclaim their right to do it. We live in perilous times. In verse 3, they are unforgiving. These people are implacable. They live with friction around them all the time. They can't make peace. They can't reconcile. They are slanderous, slanderers. This characteristic for slanderers is seen in people who persistently and consistently want to attack the reputation or attack the character of others. It's the word diabolos. It, it's a word that is used for the accuser of the brethren, Satan himself. They love themselves so much, they have to tear other people down in order to further their love for themselves. There's no self-control. They have no self-control in verse 3. They're unrestrained by any sense of morality. They'll do what it takes to get what they want, right? And they rule the ability, they, they lack the ability to rule themselves. Their conscience is seared and they just pursue whatever lust is predominant at the time and don't let anything stand in their way. They're brutal. Literally here, the word for brutal means that they behave like wild animals. They live for their appetites to satisfy their lust, to satisfy their appetites. No longer here a concern for life. That's implied in the word. And so abortion is no big deal. Sure, sell the parts, no big deal. Brutal. They're despisers of good. There's an absence of love. There's an absence of appreciation for that which is for the common good. They just don't care about that. They don't care about good. They're traitors, meaning they're treacherous. They will do what is necessary to further their own cause. If that means breaking a covenant, they'll break it for their own cause, to get what they want, to live their own lives. They'll betray a friend. They're careless about commitments. They're traitors. They're betrayers. They're headstrong, meaning that they're reckless, they're rash, they're thoughtless. They stop at nothing to achieve their ends. There's a, a defiant disregard for danger or a defiant disregard for consequences. They just don't care about the consequences. They want what they want. They're going to get it. They're more interested in pleasing themselves. They are haughty, meaning they're puffed up is literally what the word means. They're foolish. There's no humility, no lowliness of mind. They are an authority unto themselves and they won't submit to anyone else. And they are lovers of pleasure just an immoderate desire to please and indulge themselves. And all of these, all of these, all 18 of these, characterized by the 19th, an evident lack of love for God. It's a painful list, isn't it? Let's be real for a moment. Let's be relevant, shall we? <laughs> if you're a Christian, then this is the sewer from which God saved you. Amen? Amen? You were once like this. You and I, children of wrath like the others. But listen, if you're in Christ, then none of these 19 mark you any longer. If you're in Christ, you're not like this anymore. You've turned from this list. Now, why is that? If you're in Christ, you know that God has changed you, changed your heart, changed your nature. You don't live like this anymore. You've been reworked from the inside out. That old man has been put away. Now, you still struggle every now and then, but this doesn't characterize your life any longer. Why is that? Why is, what explains the change? When the Lord saved me, I was proud, boaster, blasphemer, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. I was a slanderer, no self-control, brutal, a despiser of good. When God saved me, he changed me forever. Now, why is that? If you've come to Christ, you've turned from that sin, and you've put your faith and trust in Christ alone to save you, and you're radically different. You're not the same person any longer. Why is that? 
Because God changes a man. God changes your heart. God transforms the sinner. That's why. And then God indwells you with his spirit to see to it that you obey him and you walk according to his statutes and you love the things that God loves and you hate the things that God hates. God has the power to change your life. And here he does it. You're caught up in lying or anger. Whatever sin it is, lust, drugs, alcohol. You can't change your heart. You can't change your mind, but God can. And God will if you will turn from your sin and put your faith and trust in him to do it. Cry out to God. God, listen, I'm sick of this life. I'm so tired of being a boastful, proud, blaspheming, haughty lover of pleasure rather than lover of God. God, change my wretched heart and save me for your glory. With your help, God, I will turn from this list and I will live for you till my dying day, till you take me home. And you, if you do that, if you put your faith in Christ, God will do it. Paul says something, though, here, very interesting in verse 5. Very interesting. You know, the church is made up of radically transformed trophies of God's grace. That's the church. The church are those who have turned from their sin, put their faith in Christ. They're not the same people any longer. They are trophies of God's grace. That's the church. Listen to what he says in verse 5. He says, these are people, the people represented by this list of 19 things, these are people that have a form of godliness but they deny its power. Now think about that for a moment. They have the outward shell or a fabrication of godly practice. They hold to a form of godliness, but it is a fake superficial godliness. They hold to a form of godliness, but it is a counterfeit godliness. It is devoid of the true substance of a genuine and healthy and lively and fervent faith. D.A. Carson said it is outward and showy, but not inward and authentic. It is codified and moralistic, but it's not vital and living. So now what does this mean? What does this mean? It means that this 19-part list of tragedy describes the membership of the professing church. They have a form of godliness, many of them, but they deny it. These people are in the church. They're not, this isn't describing pagan, lost, on the outside, Buddhists and Hindus. and This is describing those who take to themselves a form of godliness and yet by their lives, by their actions, they are denying its power. These wicked adjectives, these wicked adjectives are not so much concerned with those outside the church as much as they are concerned with those who profess to be a part of the church. Now get this, these are evidences of the perilous times in which we live. You go to many churches and you look, I mean, I, I know because I grew up in them. The church that I left to come here was one of these. You look up and down the rows and the pews in most of those churches and you'll see any number of these 19 marks represented there. Look at the pulpit and you'll see them. Those false pastors... And those false Christians are left to try and justify the sin that goes on in that false church. And so what do they do? What do they do with their twisted theology? What is it that they're doing? Verse 5. They essentially deny the power of true Christian godliness. They deny its power. Do you see? They deny the power of God in the gospel to produce a holy life as the fruit of genuine saving faith. 
Now listen, that power is miraculous. That power is the power of God that makes you a new person. And yet that's the power that they deny. The power there refers to that which the Holy Spirit produces in the life of one that he truly indwells. That's the power he's talking about. And so you get a so-called church full of so-called Christians living in their sin. They deny that power. They have to look around the church and say, you know, why isn't Frank and why isn't Joe and why isn't Sally living like a Christian when they are a Christian? They've said they're a Christian. Why do Christians live that way? They're asking the wrong question. Is Sally, Frank, and Joe, are they genuinely converted? Are they genuinely saved? If they're genuinely saved, God changes their heart and dwells them with his spirit and he causes them to walk in his statutes. He transforms their life. The truth is, is that many were never saved to begin with. They've made a sham profession. They've made a sham profession. And most likely that sham profession is in response to a sham presentation of the gospel. The men who teach those lies that garbage, no matter how subtle, they are mouthpieces for Satan. The church that gets the gospel, that is the center of the spiritual redemptive universe, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you get that wrong by just a minute degree, you're no longer a gospel church, you're a synagogue of Satan. And so what do you do? What do you do? Do you do you continue to go to church there? Heaven forbid. Have a love for your own eternal soul and get out of that place. Don't go to a church. Listen, it's like the, the rocket on the launch pad. We've used this analogy before. You put that rocket on the launch pad, it's going to go millions of miles. If it's a fraction of a degree off, by the time you reach your destination, you miss everything. You miss heaven. It's like that cup of water. It only has one drop of arsenic. Are you going to drink it? <laughs> Don't go to church there. Do you sit? Do you continue under that false teaching? No way. For the benefit of your soul, get out of there. Do you continue to tithe to that factory of false conversion? No. Don't support that. Support the biblical gospel. No, Paul says, you avoid them. You avoid them. Stay away from spiritual imposters. Get out from under false teaching. Those people have rejected God by their lives, and yet they still want to be counted as members of his church. They're not objects of fellowship. They are objects of evangelism. Let's... Look at an Old Testament text that describes this a little further. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. We've looked at some texts in the New Testament. Let's take a look at the Old Testament. This is the truth of Scripture beginning to end, okay? Isaiah chapter 59. These are dangerous, perilous times in which we live. Listen, as John says, little children, do not be deceived. Don't be carried away with this error. Look at Isaiah 59. Listen to this in verse 1. Behold, Isaiah says, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Now compare that to what we're looking at. Those who deny the power of the gospel to transform a life are shortening the hand of God, saying God can't save in that way. He may have saved other people that way, but I'm a Christian and my life hasn't changed that much. <laughs> Shortening the hand of God that it cannot save. Nor, verse 1, his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But listen, verse 2. Your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. As long as you persist in your sin... You have almighty God who created you. You have him as your enemy. 
You are enemies of his by your wicked works. Verse 3, for because your hands are defiled with blood, your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongue has muttered perversity, no one calls for justice anymore, nor does any plead for truth. Listen to what they do. They trust in empty words and they speak lies. Do you see that? Listen, all you got to do to be saved is just walk down this aisle, say this little prayer, believe in your heart that the Lord Jesus Christ has come into your heart. Don't ever doubt it. If you doubt it, that's Satan causing you to doubt. Meanwhile, they are loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts. All the evidence is there, but they've been taught, they've been programmed, and they've willfully received, willfully taken in the lie. They trust in empty words, and they themselves speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. Look at verse 5. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. This that they think is for their good is for their destruction. That which they think brings them peace brings them hell, brings them enmity with God. It's trusting in the light. Do you see it? It's, it's, it's eating down, sucking down that tasty lotus fruit and saying, surely, surely this sweet peace is better than toil, sweet peace better than here, repentance and faith. God redeems and then saves his people. Look at verse 15. In spite of all this, look at the grace and mercy of our God in Christ. The Lord saw it, verse 15, halfway through there, and it displeased him that there was no justice. Verse 16, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. Not your own arm, his own arm. Do you see? His own righteousness, it sustained him. For he put on, a, uh, put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. If you're outside of Christ, does that not terrify you? That is the judgment of God against you. One day, God, almighty God, will clothe himself with vengeance against you. Will clothe himself with recompense to his enemies, you. The coastlands, he says, verse 18, he will fully repay. Verse 19, so shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. Look at verse 20, though. Praise God, right? God, God is so merciful, so gracious, so compassionate. Even when we are so vile, representing all 19 of that list, look at God. The Redeemer will come to Zion. And to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord... As for me, now look here at the response. Look at what he says they will do. Verse 21, as for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant, my promise with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants says the Lord from this time and forevermore. Amen. Here, the response to this wickedness, the response to this reality, the response to these false gospels, this teaching of error, these empty words, these lies, the response is to cling to the truth of God. So back in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6, you must cling to the truth. First, there's a call to discernment in verses 1 through 5, and then there's a duty implied in verses 6 through 8. You must cling to the truth. One of the reasons you must cling to the truth is because there are many antichrists who have come into the world and they are deceiving and they are being deceived. Look at verse 6. 
For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. Now of that sort described in verses 1 through 5, you have particular Christian traitors here, false Christians, they're traitors who creep in. They worm their way in by deception, worm their way in under pretense, and these creeps make captives of gullible women, all right? Now that word captive there is used for prisoners of war. That's what it means. You're a prisoner of war. They deceive, they mislead, they assume power, and they assume influence over weak, here it's gullible women, it applies to anyone. Weak, gullible people. And they lead them astray, like wolves that separate a weak lamb from the flock to do all kinds of good to that little sheep, right? <laughs> no, no, you're going to kill that sheep. Like hyenas running down a little baby wildebeest, separating that calf from her mother. This specifically mentions here gullible women. And there was a problem uh, with some of the women of the church in Ephesus. We don't have time to get into that. But this was a scathing rebuke of them. The word literally means here little. And it was a, it was a grievous pejorative. It was a, a scathing rebuke. It, it means silly, foolish, weak-willed women. They were easy prey. The implication here from the, from the Greek is that they have essentially allowed themselves to be carted off spiritually by these, these religious quacks. They've done it to themselves as much as it was done to them, okay? They lack discernment. They couldn't discern the times. They couldn't discern the danger. They didn't see the peril that they were in. They didn't care enough about the truth. And so they allowed themselves, they allowed these false teachers with their schemes and deceptions to come in and lull them, take them, lead them away to be prisoners of war, captives. And they lack the strength. They lack the faith. They lack the knowledge of God's word to resist their assaults. Now these women, and this applies to you men also, they're described in four ways. One, in verse 6, they are loaded down with sins. Also in verse 6, they are led away by various lusts. In verse 7, they are always learning. And at the end of verse 7, they are never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Loaded down with sins, led away with lusts, always learning, never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. In verse 6, they are loaded down with sins. Now based on the grammar, these are past sins. They're loaded down, burdened by their old life, their past life. They profess Christ... But they don't understand the justification and the forgiveness that Christ brings. And so they're laden down with guilt and condemnation over their old lives. They're heaped up with guilt, if you will, by a load of their past sins. They're loaded down with sins. And in that condition then, in verse 6, they are led away by diverse, various, many different lusts. They're willingly swayed. Willingly slayed. Willingly slayed and swayed by various lusts, irresistible cravings and desires. The word here is passive, meaning that they're not in control themselves. They're led away. They allow this to happen to themselves. They're not in control of their lusts. Verse 7, they're always learning. They're always sitting under instruction, but it's the instruction of error here, the instruction of these false teachers. And Although always learning, they're never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Their continuous effort is consistently matched by their continuous failure. Right? In, the, in this way, these women are clinging to false teachers, not clinging to the truth of God in Christ. They're not clinging to the truth. And they feed one another. The women feed these false teachers, and these false teachers just feed these gullible women, feed gullible men. And these foolish women, foolish men today, never make any progress. Let me apply this to our context today. There are numerous professing churches today, be warned, there are numerous professing churches today that preach a gospel message that does not call for a response of repentance or turning from sin. 
It leaves people loaded down with the guilt and condemnation of their past sins. They don't preach repentance. All you have to do is A, B, C. Right? Have you ever heard that? Admit, believe, and confess. The problem is, is there's no R. And they don't teach the R. And if they say the R, repentance, there's no biblical definition of it. It's no different than confession. And confession of sin is not enough. You must turn from your sin. Pray this prayer, they'll say. There's no repentance involved. Listen, you can sit down and pray that prayer, have every intention of turning from sin. But listen, if you get up from that prayer and walk out that door and you don't repent, then you're going to hell. It doesn't matter how sincerely you prayed that prayer. Your faith is is not in the sincerity with which you prayed a prayer. Your faith is to be in Christ alone who has now justified you and turned you from sin. Because they've never truly repented, they're still led away with various lusts. Because they never really abandoned their sin at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, they're still loaded down with sins and heaped up with guilt. They'll sit in that false church and they'll hear. They'll sit under that false teacher preaching that false gospel. And because they're getting a fool's gold, they will never, ever come to a knowledge of the truth. They just sit deceived year after year. They'll never make any progress. I've witnessed to people for years like this. Known, I know people who are still trapped in this error. They're sitting on the island with the lotus eaters just taking in that juicy fruit. <laughs> and it's killing them. You must cling to the truth of God in Christ. The example that's given here is of two brothers. These names don't come from scripture. Uh, they come from Jewish tradition that grew up around this story. Uh, there's enough evidence to know that these are two historical figures in verse 8. And these two brothers given as examples. Look at verse 8. Now just as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. They are men of corrupt minds, disapproved concerning the faith. Now in Jewish tradition, these two were brothers and magicians that served in Pharaoh's court. They served in Pharaoh's court. And so they opposed Moses. If you remember, we don't have time to turn there, Exodus 7, Exodus 9. Moses comes into the court, he takes his staff, he throws it down, it becomes a snake. Right? So what do the magicians, what do the sorcerers do? Well, they throw down their staffs. They become a snake, right? They imitate Moses. They resist the truth of God and what Moses was communicating, what Moses was doing, with their lies, with their fabrication, with their sorceries. They resist him with their lies. When he turns the water to blood, well, the magicians come along and they do something similar. But they were exposed. <laughs> they were exposed. They resisted the truth spoken by Moses for a while. But when you get to Exodus chapter 7, Exodus chapter 9, Exodus chapter 8, Exodus chapter 9, they're exposed as fakes, as charlatans. When Moses comes and brings the flies, the lice, the gnats, they can't imitate that. And they're exposed as liars in Pharaoh's court. They can't imitate the darkness. They can't imitate the hailstones. They can't imitate the angel of death. And so they're exposed. Their progress only goes so far before they are disapproved, rejected as liars and as the charlatans, as the snake oil sales salesmen that they are. They had a form of godliness, do you see? But they denied its true power. And here Paul says they are disqualified, rejected. If you look at verse 8, just as Janice and Jambres do, so do these also. These men in our times, these perilous times, these who represent that list of 19 tragedies, these also do just as they did with their sorceries, right? With their counterfeit, fake power, they try to imitate the truth. But listen, they're going to be exposed. It only goes so far, and pretty soon it's confirmed as a lie. 
these false teachers who fail to preach the truth, the weak and foolish people who never come to the truth, and the others who resist the truth and are disqualified will be exposed as fakes. So what is Paul then, back in 2 Timothy chapter 3, what does Paul then command Timothy to do? Look down at 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 10. What does Paul instruct Timothy to do? But you, Timothy, have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. He commends his example to Timothy and tells Timothy to follow his example. Cling to my doctrine, Timothy. Cling to my manner of life. Follow my example. Drop down to verse 14. But you, Timothy, must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them, that from the childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Cling to the word of God. Drop down to verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Listen, use scripture for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that for the purpose that the man of God might be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living at the dead at his appearing and in his kingdom. Preach your own opinions, Timothy. No, verse 2, preach the word of God. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. The time will come when they're not going to endure that kind of stuff any longer. This passage, written in the context that we're looking at here, is talking about using the word of God, clinging to the truth of God to properly combat error. Protect yourself from error and protect others from error as he tells Timothy that you might be able to save both yourself and those who hear you. Cling faithfully to the truth. The most important, your most important priority is your own soul. Cling to the truth. Now this is a, a bleak text up to this point in many ways, but one that is necessary for us to understand. As necessary for us to understand today as it was for those in Ephesus to understand in their day. Discern the times cling to the truth. Don't compromise with error. Cling to God's word. And I want you to see in verse 9 a glimpse of Paul's optimism with respect to all this. Look at verse 9. Point 3 on your notes, we're to hope in Christ. We're to hope in Christ. Despite this assault, we must face as Christians on this side of eternity, despite that assault that we must face, we face, we fight a vanquished foe. Take hope in Christ. Verse 9, but they will progress no further for their folly will be manifest to all as theirs also was. Because of Christ, the truth will win the day. It's already been determined. Paul is convinced they're not going to get far. This doesn't mean that they won't be effective in their deceptions, but it does mean that the truth will win out. They can only go so far. And they're contrasted here, interestingly enough, with the Lord. They will progress no further, but Luke chapter 2 verse 52 says of Jesus that even as a boy, he kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. These will make no progress, but those who follow Christ will. They'll increase in wisdom. They'll increase in stature. They'll increase with favor, in favor with God and men just like the Lord Jesus Christ did. Genuine faith. Genuine faith involves a clear view of our difficulties while maintaining this hope in Christ. Where does this hope come from? This optimism, where does it come from? It comes from the glory of God in Christ in the gospel. Romans chapter 5 verse 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 24, we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Discern the times. Cling to the truth. Hope in Christ. Don't be led away as willing, weak, and a gullible prisoner of war in this battle that rages for your soul. Christ has won the decisive victory. Rather than being born 
in the sin of Adam, he was born of the Virgin Mary. He was victorious in fulfilling the just demands of God's law, his holy and perfect law, by himself being holy and perfect, living a perfectly sinless life. You and I were defeated and cursed in the law, our sin exposed and condemned by the law. He was victorious, fulfilling the just demands of God's law. He was victorious, victorious in satisfying the wrath of God that you and I rightly deserve for our own sin. He took that wrath upon himself and satisfied to the full, drank to the dregs the wrath of God that sinners rightly deserve. The Lord Jesus Christ took that upon himself. He stood as your substitute. He took upon himself your sin, imputed to himself your sin, and he clothed you, imputed to you his righteousness. He was victorious over sin and death. That's seen in his resurrection from the dead. And you can now be raised too from death, even now, to walk in newness of life if you will put your faith and trust in him alone. Repent. Turn from your sin. Put your faith in Christ. Stop being gullible. Stop being weak. Stop being proud, haughty. Stop being a blasphemer. Stop being unthankful, unloving, unforgiving. Stop loving only yourself. Stop loving pleasure more than loving your creator. Stop giving in to those who have wormed their way into your life, into your spiritual household to lead you away. Stop giving in to them. Avoid them. Stop spinning your wheels, languishing in your ignorance, making no progress. Don't resist the truth, as Janice and Jambres did. Cling to the truth of God in Christ. Abandon your sin and put your faith and trust in him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Take just a few moments and go to God. Ask God to free you from this list if you're not already free. Ask God to continue to free you from that tragic list in verses two through five. Even if you have been set free, you still battle with that indwelling sin. If you're not saved, ask God to change your heart to endue you with real power in the gospel. Stop playing games. Stop wallowing in self-love. Love the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we need you, God. We need your power. We need your word, your truth. We need Christ, your son. God, we need your righteousness, the righteousness of God in Christ. We need your forgiveness. We need your justification. God, we need you. We need the gospel. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that in Christ, for those that have put their faith and trust in him, you have declared us righteous in him, that you have clothed us in his righteousness, that you have forgiven us of all our sin, cleansed us of all our iniquity, that you have set us in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that you have raised us up together, God, that you have adopted us as children of God, that you've transferred us from the kingdom of, of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son, God, that you have changed us and transformed us. And then, God, by virtue of the power of your spirit within us, God, you've given us power to live a godly life before you, to be pleasing in your sight, to live for you, to produce the fruit that you say will be there in every single person who has been genuinely saved by grace. We praise you for the glorious gifts that we have in Christ this great salvation that in your infinite wisdom you have ordained from times past for our good and for your glory. Thank you, Lord, for this text. God, thank you for this 
clear warning, this clear picture of the times in which we live. God, help us to be mindful of those times and to fervently cling to the cross, cling to Christ, cling to the truth, and living out the Christian life in the times in which we live for your glory. May we, may we be faithful and fervent with the gospel. God, may we, in these times, go out in hope, knowing that we fight a vanquished foe, that in Christ the victory has been won, that we can go out in faith, trusting you, doing the work that you've appointed beforehand for us to do, and know that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. We thank you, Lord, for all these glorious gifts, for your goodness to us. And we worship and praise you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.